I had believed that the day couldn't possibly worsen, but I was mistaken. The entire week at work had been dreadful, and to top it off, my boss, the company president, called me into his office to reprimand me for a mistake made by someone else. Upon arriving home, I discovered my sister-in-law's car blocking my driveway, preventing me from parking in front of my own house. The neighbor's teenage son and his friends had filled the street with parked cars, forcing me to park three doors down. Entering the house, I questioned why I bothered. My relationship with my wife's sister, Susan, had always been strained since the day we met. I couldn't fathom why, but she seemed to harbor an immediate dislike for me. Furthermore, I had little hope for an intimate evening with my wife, Janice, as we hadn't been intimate in almost a month, despite my persistent efforts. Arriving at my driveway, I noticed an empty garbage can by the curb and dragged it around the side of the house, through the side gate, placing it next to the back door. Entering the kitchen, I heard music and the chatter of my wife and her sister in the living room. Grabbing a beer from the refrigerator, I took a swig before heading towards the living room. However, a sentence overheard at the door froze me in my tracks. God, he f***ed me three times today, came not from my sister-in-law, but from my beloved wife. Ever since Brandon came back last month, I just can't get enough of his cock, my wife confessed. I knew Brandon as my wife's ex-boyfriend who had left her and moved away. Curious, my wife's sister asked. So what are you going to do now? Janice replied, Brandon wants me to move in with him, so I'll get a lawyer and file for divorce. This is a community property state, so I'll get half of everything. I had heard more than enough. Numbly, I made my way to the back door and retraced my steps to my car. Opening the door, I sank into the driver's seat, now realizing the reason I had been denied any intimacy. My wife was sharing it with someone else, and now she wanted half of everything. The worst part was that the state was likely to grant it to her. Janice and I had tied the knot just three years ago. She had quit her job right after our vows, and when she was at home, she never lifted a finger. I hired a maid three times a week for house cleaning and laundry, and on those days, she would cook dinner. The rest of the time, either I cooked or she ordered takeout. I know what you might be thinking, but love wore blinders on me. She kept me happy by providing good sex, at least until a month ago. My mother passed away when I was 13, a devastating loss for both my father and me. Dad did his best to raise me right, and we became very close. Losing him to a drunk driver when I was 23 was a significant blow, occurring just a year before I met Janice. Inheriting nearly two and a half million from dad, I wisely kept the money invested with the guidance of a good broker. Despite Janice's attempts to spend every dime I earned, I had another hundred thousand in savings. I had never touched the inheritance, making it grow even in the current economy. I had enough to live comfortably, and I didn't have to spend it. My love for Janice led us to skip a prenuptial agreement, a naive mistake many make thinking their marriage will last forever. This oversight meant she could potentially take almost a million and a half from me, all for the privilege of spreading her legs. The state seemed all too willing to support this legalized form of exploitation. She had mentioned getting a lawyer, indicating she wasn't yet prepared to serve me. I knew I had some time to act. Formulating a plan, I sat in my car, keeping an eye on the rearview mirror until I saw my sister-in-law's car pull out and drive away. I started the car, made a U-turn, and walked back to my driveway. Upon entering the house, Janice was nowhere to be seen, so I headed to the kitchen for another beer, popping the top and taking a long sip as I contemplated my next steps. Oh, there you are, honey, Janice greeted, entering the kitchen. I didn't hear you come in. Hello, dear. Just got home. Been a long day, I replied with a loving smile, determined to play the role as convincingly as she did. I didn't have time to order anything for dinner, she said with a slight pout. Although I wanted to say, that's because you spent your day with your boyfriend, sharing all the details with your sister, 
What I uttered was, that's okay, sweetie. I'll just heat up some leftovers from last night. Janice gave me a sweet smile, kissed my cheek, and announced, I'm going to go up and soak in a hot bath. Smiling and nodding, I thought, yeah, got to wash all that away. When she left, I grabbed a box of fried rice and ate it cold while downing two more beers. After tossing the empty container, I retreated to the den and settled into my recliner. Channel surfing, I settled on an old John Wayne Weston. When Janice returned half an hour later, she sat on the couch until the movie ended. Standing up, she claimed she was tired and heading to bed. Yeah, tired from being unfaithful. Sweetie, I told her I would watch the news and join her later. I hadn't really paid attention to the movie, my mind occupied with plotting my next move. Knowing I couldn't do much until Monday, I endured the next few days, working in the yard on Saturday and playing golf with buddies on Sunday. On Monday, I called my broker handling my inheritance portfolio and had everything liquidated. Being in upper management allowed me to cash in my 400 and 1k swiftly, penalty be damned. By Thursday, I was ready to make my move. Returning home to my supposedly loving wife, I informed her of an emergency situation, explaining that I would be flying out for a week on company business. I packed two suitcases. That was all I needed. When we moved into this house, I had stored everything important to me. None of it fit with her taste, so there was nothing else I desired. The furnishings were her choices, and frankly, I couldn't care less about them. The silver lining in this situation was that we were renting the house, so I had no financial investment tied up in it. Having recently sold my condo, we were in the process of finding the right house to buy. When I say right, I mean right according to her standards. So far, none of the houses we had looked at seemed to meet her criteria. On a Friday morning, I kissed my wife on the cheek one last time and carried my suitcases out the door. Loading them into my Lexus, I drove away without a single backward glance. My first stop was at an old buddy's place, Jake, whom I trusted implicitly. He was astonished when I proposed trading titles for his older but rebuilt four-wheel drive vehicle. Confiding in him about my situation, an hour later, I was headed west. I doubted anyone would connect me to this vehicle, and Jake promised to keep the car I traded him hidden in the garage for a while. For the next four days, I paid for everything in cash. I had cancelled all our credit cards to avoid leaving a paper trail. The majority of my money was now safely tucked away in an offshore account, thanks to my broker. I had a system in place with him to arrange fund transfers when needed. I had enough cash, hidden in the SUV, to last for a while. The nights alone in motels were the toughest. For the past week, I had been too occupied with executing my plan to reflect on what had happened to me personally. I had loved Janice. I wouldn't have married her if I hadn't. I played through various what-if scenarios in my mind, but ultimately, I concluded that there wasn't much I could have done differently. Even if I had known her old boyfriend had returned, I doubted I could have kept them apart. I arrived at two conclusions. She probably never truly loved me, and it was my own fault for being foolish enough to marry her. On the fifth day away from home, I found myself sitting in a mom-and-pop diner in a small town in Montana. I pondered what my supposedly loving wife was up to, as by now, she must have discovered that all her credit cards were cancelled, and our bank account held no money. My thoughts were interrupted by an older couple at the next table, whose quiet conversation I couldn't help but overhear. The man, who appeared to be in his late fifties, was telling his red-haired wife about his wish for an extra hand on their farm. Unfortunately, they couldn't afford to hire anyone until their current calves were ready for the market. Even then, finding someone willing to work for what they could pay proved to be a challenge. Finishing the last bite of my meal, I stood up and approached their table, expressing my apologies for eavesdropping, but suggesting I might be able to help them. I'm sorry for overhearing, but maybe I can assist you, I offered. The older man scrutinized me, sizing me up. 
I don't see how you could do that. If you heard what we were talking about, you know I can't pay you anything. What if I just need a place to stay in exchange for my labor? I proposed. His eyes narrowed. Colleen, excuse us for a moment while I speak to this young man outside, he said to his wife. Standing up, he waited for me to follow him. Once in the parking lot, where our conversation would remain private, he turned to face me. I estimated him to be about my height, six feet, with broad shoulders and not an ounce of fat. His once dark hair was mostly grey, and his face showed the rugged lines of years spent working outdoors. His dark brown eyes bore into me. Who the hell are you? Are you part of that Wilson bunch? He asked with a hint of suspicion. I raised my hands defensively. Hold on there, mister. I don't know anything about any Wilsons. Four days ago, I was living in Texas, and I just arrived here this morning. I thought maybe we could help each other out. If what you say is true, why would you want to help us out? I can't afford to pay you. What's in it for you? If you're on the run from the law, we don't need that kind of trouble. I'm probably on the run, as you put it, but not like you may think, I explained. I proceeded to share my story about my unfaithful wife wanting to take me to the cleaners and how I could use a place to stay for a while. I haven't robbed or killed anybody. I'm just trying to keep what's rightfully mine. If you have a place I could stay, I'll repay you with my labor. I'll pay my own way, and if you don't think I'm any help, tell me, and I'll be on my way with no hard feelings. He studied my face. Son, if what you're telling me is the truth, I think I'd be a fool not to at least give you a shot. I have to tell you up front though, the Wilsons are trying to get me to sell my land to them. They haven't done anything underhanded yet, but I wouldn't put it past them. You might be biting off more than you can chew. I informed him that it was a risk I was willing to take. Bill then inquired about my ranching experience, and I was honest, admitting that I had spent a few summers on my uncle's place in Texas. But I wasn't a cowboy. He extended his hand, and we shook on our agreement. Bill suggested I call him by his first name, and I introduced myself. We walked back into the diner, where Colleen awaited. Colleen, this is Carson Jones. He's going to be working for us, if he can handle it, Bill announced. Colleen stood and extended her hand. I shook it, and she greeted me warmly. It's very nice to meet you, Carson. Her voice held a clear tone, with perhaps a lingering hint of an Irish accent. Like her husband, she was trim and fit, radiating a pleasant demeanor. It's nice to meet you too, missus. I realized Bill hadn't mentioned his last name. Buckman. The last name is Buckman. But you just call me Colleen. Don't really have much use for formality in this part of the country. I instantly liked this gracious lady. Bill suggested we head back to the ranch. Before leaving town, he pulled up to a general store, and we both stepped out. I thought you might want to pick up some clothes suitable for ranch work, he said. Yeah, you're right. I don't think what I brought with me would last long. I replied, grateful for his foresight. Entering the store, Bill received a warm greeting from the owner, clearly a regular customer. Forty minutes later, I had enough jeans, work shirts, a coat, and a pair of Western-style riding boots for a week. It was sufficient for the time being. From the general store, it was about a twenty-five-mile drive to the main gate, arched with the name Rocking Bee Ranch. That was Bill's brand. A rocking bee, another mile of a private road led to the main house. Perched on a rise, their two-story house looked well-maintained and freshly painted. Behind it, a barn and several outbuildings came into view. The pickup they drove was partly loaded with sacks of groceries, indicating their weekly trip into town for supplies. I pulled up behind them, filled my arms with bags, and followed the Buckmans into the kitchen. In two trips, we had the truck unloaded. Bill instructed me to drive around back, where he showed me a small cabin for my stay. As I pulled around, I saw him standing in front of the cabin. When I got out, he pointed to the cabin and mentioned that Sam used a similar one a few yards away, adding that Sam was out making the rounds and I would meet him later. 
After unloading my bags, Bill waited while I settled into the cabin. It had a single large room with a bed along one wall, a table with two chairs, a pot-belly wood stove in one corner, and a bathroom with a single stall shower. It wasn't luxurious, but it was clean and served as a suitable place to stay, for now, at least, allowing me to hopefully avoid being found by Janice. When I returned outside, Bill was sitting in his pickup and told me to hop in. He took me on a tour of the ranch, which covered almost 6,000 acres. 5,000 acres were relatively flat and suitable for grazing, with a couple of hundred acres set aside for growing winter feed. The back section of the ranch, hilly and covered in forest, led to mountains with a stream flowing through the property, accessible only on horseback. Bill shared that he used to have three full-time hands, but Sam was the only one left after tough times. Sam had been working on the ranch for nearly 30 years. During roundups for selecting stock to take to market, they hired extra help. Bill dropped me off at the little cabin around five o'clock. By the way, I noticed you carry a laptop. I've got a satellite connection with a router, so you can access the internet wirelessly. Supper is in the main house, and we normally eat at six, Bill mentioned before driving away. In less than 30 minutes, I had settled in, leaving me time to boot up my computer. As Bill had mentioned, I was able to make a wireless connection, and I quickly checked my email. There was one message from Jake, stating that Janice had reported me missing to the police, and they were investigating my disappearance. It gave me something to ponder. Jake was the only one I had actually told about leaving, and even he didn't know where I was going. I had mailed my resignation to my former employer, but hadn't informed them in person about my departure. Just before six, I walked over to the main house and knocked on the kitchen door. Bill called for me to come in, and as I stepped inside, I saw Colleen preparing food while Bill stood to the side talking to a man I assumed was Sam. Bill motioned me over. Sam, this is Carson, the new hand I mentioned, at least for today. We'll see how he feels about it tomorrow after a day's work, Bill said with a broad grin. Carson meet Sam. Sam gave me a warm smile and extended his hand. A big man, at least six foot three, he, like Bill, appeared to have worked hard throughout his life and seemed around the same age as Bill. One notable detail, he was African American. I shook his hand, sensing the strength in his grip. Well, young man, let's hope you like it here. I could use the help, he said. At 28, I was about half his age, so he considered me young. I plan to give it my best shot, I replied. Just then, Colleen called us to sit down as supper was ready. Bill and his wife sat at opposite ends of the table, leaving Sam and me to sit between them across from each other. On the table were a large platter of pork chops, a big bowl of mashed potatoes, another with fresh green beans, and a plate stacked with obviously homemade biscuits. We don't eat fancy here, Carson, Colleen said. But there's plenty, and it's filling. My mouth watered. It looks great, I replied. As we ate, I asked Bill if he had been here all his life. Yep. My grandfather started this ranch and passed it on to my father. Now it belongs to me and Colleen. Bill paused as if in thought. Although when I was younger, I wasn't so sure she was going to be a part of it. I had to fight off every man in three counties to get her. Bill looked at his wife, and I could see the depth of his love for her in his eyes. Now, Bill, you know you're the only man I ever had eyes for. I just had to make sure that you wanted me enough, Colleen said. My wife has been responsible for the three happiest days of my life. The day she agreed to marry me, the day she did marry me, and the day she gave birth to our daughter Caitlin, Bill said. I hadn't seen any sign of a daughter, and Colleen must have noticed my curious look. Our daughter is away right now. Caitlin is finishing her doctorate's degree in veterinary sciences at South Dakota State. She has only been able to get home for the holidays, and we are anxiously waiting for her to come back home with her degree. She's supposed to be home in a couple of months, Colleen said. It'll be nice to have a vet in the family.
should cut down on some of the expenses, Bill added with a grin. After dinner, I attempted to help clear the dishes, but Colleen insisted that it was her job and shooed me away. Bill mentioned that breakfast was at 5.30 and work would commence at 6. As Sam and I were leaving, I noticed a copy of today's New York Times on the counter, likely picked up by Bill in town. I asked if I could borrow the front page, and he agreed. Once outside, I asked Sam to step into my cabin for a moment. Inside, I took out my digital camera and showed him how to use it. I had him take a close-up of me holding up the front page of the newspaper. I could tell he was curious, but he didn't ask. He did inquire about an alarm clock, and I assured him I had one. He said he would see me in the morning and left. I downloaded the picture to my computer and pasted it into an email along with a note to the police in my former hometown. The message stated that I was alive and well, and I had left town of my own free will. Choosing a national newspaper instead of a local one kept my location ambiguous. I sent the email to Jake and instructed him to use one of the local coffee shops with free internet access, as my work email would likely still be active. I provided my password so he could forward the original email and picture to the police without leaving any traceable paths. This way, I hope to avoid being listed on any FBI or national missing person lists, assuming the police wouldn't allocate extensive resources to search for a runaway husband. I slept soundly that night. The next morning, I was up at five, showered, and dressed in time to walk with Sam to the main house. Breakfast featured eggs, sausage, hash browns, and toast, with plenty for all. After eating, Bill instructed Sam to put me to work replacing fence posts in the hilly section. Following Sam to the barn, he pointed out a horse and saddle I would need. Keeping a close eye on me, Sam seemed satisfied with the way I saddled the big brown mare, drawing on my experience from my uncle's ranch. We then took two mules, attaching saddle packs to load fence posts and a post hole digger. Bill joined us at the barn carrying a Winchester Model 94 in a saddle scabbard, explaining it was mainly for the rare occasion when we might need to put down a sick cow. Mounted up and leading a mule each, Sam and I headed out, following the creek up into the hills. As Sam and I rode, we engaged in conversation and got to know each other. I shared the story of how I ended up in Montana, trusting that he wouldn't betray my confidence. In return, Sam recounted his own experiences. He had married right after high school, only to discover his ex-wife in bed with another man. In a fit of rage, he had nearly beaten the guy to death, resulting in a five-year prison sentence. Upon his release, Bill was the only one willing to give him a chance, and that was how he had spent the last 30 years here. Sam spoke highly of Bill and Colleen, considering them to be the salt of the earth. As the morning sun cast its glow on the breathtaking mountains in the background, it was the beginning of April, and though the snow had melted in the low elevations, some still adorned the peaks. Upon reaching the tree line, the trail began to ascend. Half an hour later, we reached the fence marking the property boundaries. Sam pointed out that not all the posts needed replacement, only those that had rotted or were close to it approximately every third one. He stayed with me while I replaced the first two to ensure I was doing it correctly. Sam suggested working until around four, allowing me enough time to return, care for the horse and mules, and make it to dinner at six. His parting advice was to follow the stream back down, ensuring I wouldn't get lost. Sam headed back, leaving me alone with my work. There was something calming and soothing about being in this beautiful, hilly, forested country. I progressed down the line, replacing old posts with new ones. At noon, I took a break and retrieved the pork chop sandwiches that Colleen had given me in the morning from my saddlebag. Leftovers from the previous night's meal, they were just as delicious today. As I quietly ate, I observed a blue jay passing through the trees a woodpecker briefly stopping to hammer at a tree, and a white-tailed deer appearing in the opening on the other side of the fence. She cautiously approached until catching my scent, 
then snorted and bounded back into the trees, waving her tail in the air like a flag. I finished my sandwiches and returned to work. My watch's alarm beat to four in the afternoon. I noticed that I had set all but a couple of the posts that the mules had carried up. Leading the mules, I traced back along the fence line until I found the stream and began descending. Just before leaving the trees, I discovered a natural pool where the stream flowed in and out. I stopped and admired the view, recognizing it as the most beautiful and serene spot on the ranch. Back at the barn, I managed to unsaddle the animals and get them fed in time. While I was tending to the horses, Sam entered to bed down his horse. When I informed him that I had set all but two of the posts, he seemed surprised and impressed. We rushed to wash up and change before supper, where we enjoyed steaks that night. At the dinner table, Bill was visibly impressed when Sam shared the progress I had made during the day. Exhausted, I made minimal contributions to the conversation and excused myself immediately after dinner to go to bed. Sleep came quickly, and I slept deeply. When I woke up, I was sore all over. My hands ached from wielding the post hole digger and my arms, shoulders, and legs throbbed. Despite my regular workouts, there was a vast difference between a two-hour gym session and a full day of setting fence posts. As I limped into the kitchen and winced while sitting down, I received a couple of chuckles from Bill and Sam. Even Colleen couldn't completely hide her grin. However, despite the soreness, I was ravenous and eagerly devoured my breakfast. Ready for another day of fencing, Bill asked as we rose from the table. I groaned and replied, Yes, sir, hoping to sound more optimistic than I felt. Bill laughed, I think you can give it a rest today. I'd like you to ride the rounds with Sam. I nodded appreciatively. The first task was to clean the stalls and replace the hay. After putting the horses and mules in the pasture and filling their feeder, we loaded up in the pickup and began our range inspection. Our primary goal was to ensure no cows were down or calves separated from their mothers. Sam's knowledge of the ranch seemed instinctual, and he effortlessly anticipated where the cattle would be and roughly estimated their numbers. After 30 years, it seemed to come naturally to him. As we reached the far end of the ranch, Sam stopped the truck and surveyed the surroundings. Something on one of the hills caught his attention prompting him to hand me his binoculars and point to a specific spot. After a minute, I identified two calves seemingly alone. Where are their mothers? I inquired. Sam gestured towards two cows near the tree line. That's them over there. Their calves must have wandered into the trees, got lost, and kept going. We'll have to bring them down. Are we hiking up there? I asked. Nah, it's too far. We'll go back and load up a couple of horses. The pickups were equipped with two-way radios, and Sam called Bill, informing him of what we had seen and that we were on our way to get the horses. When we returned to the barn, Bill had already saddled two horses and loaded them into a trailer. All we had to do was fuck up and go. Sam navigated us close to the tree line below where the calves were, and we unloaded the horses, riding up into the hills. Sam's thirty years on the ranch became evident once again as he knew the terrain like the back of his hand. Half an hour later, we eased up behind the calves and slowly began to push them back down the hills. I couldn't help but laugh when we cleared the trees and the wayward juveniles spotted their mothers. They ran bawling to their moms and immediately sought out a teat to nurse on. The larger cows stood patiently, allowing their young to feed. It struck me how different it was from my childhood. That night's supper featured fried chicken, corn on the cob, and mashed potatoes. The platter was piled high with perfectly cooked breasts, legs, and thighs. With newfound energy, I talked more than the night before and learned more about Colleen. Her parents had immigrated to the United States from Ireland when she was five years old. Her father, fascinated by tales of the Old West, had brought the family to Montana, explaining the trace of Irish brogue in her speech. Growing up in America, she still retained the influence of her parents. 
Feeling much better the next day, I returned to replace fence posts after breakfast. Sam helped me load up the mules, but this time, I headed out on my own. Following the stream led me directly to my destination. This day proved to be easier than the first, as I had learned some tricks to make the work less strenuous. Just before four o'clock, I set the last post and headed back to the barn. With some extra time, I mucked some of the stalls before cleaning up for dinner. On my fourth day, I assisted Sam in making repairs to some of the buildings, and the following day, I set more fence posts. The next two months flew by, and I now took my turn riding the range to check on the cattle. I was in the best shape of my life. We established a schedule where Sam took Saturdays off, Bill took off Sundays, and Mondays were my days off. I used my day to do laundry and run into town if needed. I had grown quite fond of everyone on the ranch. Sam was good-natured and easygoing, and we often sat and talked after supper. I had a lot of respect for Bill, honest and hardworking. We got along well. Colleen was very sweet to Sam and me, but I could see she had some fire in her. Together, she and Bill made a great couple. Colleen and Bill were growing excited. At breakfast on Friday, Colleen informed me that her daughter would be returning home in one week. It was my turn that day to take a horse and ride through the wooded section, checking for cattle that might have wandered into the hills. A little after four, I made my way to the stream, turned to follow it down, and reached the pool below the waterfall. I stopped, dismounted, took off my shirt, and knelt down next to the water. Dipping my bandana into the cool water, I began to wash the sweat and dust from my face and neck. A whinny from downstream caught my attention, and I looked to my right to see a horse and rider approaching. At first, I thought it was Colleen, but quickly realized this was a younger version of her. This beautiful woman could only be Caitlin, with the same crystal blue eyes and red hair as her mother. She rode up and stopped several feet from me as I stood up and faced her. Her eyes lingered on my bare chest, revealing the two months of hard work in my taut muscles. Who are you, and what are you doing on this property? She snapped in a haughty tone. Name's Carson, and I work here, I replied. I don't believe you. My dad said he couldn't afford to pay another hand, she said. Despite her beauty, I was getting a little aggravated at her unfriendly tone. Yeah, I heard that too. I guess that's why I laugh all the way to the bank every payday. Caitlin glared at me, reined her horse around, and gave it a kick in the sides. I chuckled to myself, put my shirt back on, remounted my horse, and continued towards the barn. Later, I found out there had been a miscommunication between Caitlin and her parents. They thought she was coming home the next week. Instead, much to their surprise, she had arrived a couple of hours after I had ridden out. She had spent the morning and the early part of the afternoon with her parents until she expressed her desire to go for a ride. Something she hadn't had time for in school, but loved to do. So she saddled up and rode to her favorite spot, the waterfall and pool of water. I guess, after two months, I was old news, and Bill and Colleen had forgotten to mention me. Just as I rounded the barn, I saw the back of the redhead disappear inside. I dismounted and proceeded to lead my horse inside. Kaitlin must have been looking for her father and finally found him in the barn. I could clearly hear her loud voice. Who is that man that was up at the waterfall? She demanded to know. Bill thought for a minute. That must have been Carson, he answered. He said he works here. But last time I was here, you told me you couldn't afford to pay another hand. Well, he's right. He does work here. As for what he gets paid, I don't think that's any of your business. I still own this ranch, young lady. Daddy, he says you pay him so much that he laughs all the way to the bank, she sputtered. By that point, I had walked into the barn. Kitlin had her back to me and didn't see me. Bill did and gave me a grin. Is that true, Carson? If you think you're overpaid, I can rectify that, he said to me. Kaitlin spun around and locked me in her glare. I pulled my hat off with one hand and scratched the back of my head with the other. 
Well, I would hate to take advantage of you, Bill. Just how much are you thinking of cutting my wages? I asked. At that, Bill and I both cracked up laughing. Caitlin continued to glare at both of us, failing to see the humor. Sweetheart, just so you get that bee out of your bonnet, Carson gets to stay in the cabin next to Sam's, Bill said. And what else? She still demanded to know. That, and he gets to eat your mother's fine cooking. So you're saying you aren't paying him? Why would he work for nothing? Caitlin persisted. He has his reasons, and it's not my place to tell you, Bill said. Working to have a chance to taste your mother's cooking is worth a lot. I don't think she would like to hear you say that it's nothing, I chipped in. Kaitlin shot me one more glare and stormed out of the barn. Bill shook his head. She reminds me so much of her mother when she was young. I didn't think I would ever tame Colleen. At supper that night, we were joined by Caitlin. She sat next to Sam on the opposite side of the table from me. She gave me another sharp look when I entered the kitchen. I waited until everyone had filled their plates before speaking. Your mother tells me that you have finished your doctorate in veterinary medicine, I said in a pleasant voice. Yeah, was her one-word answer given without looking up. Sam says that there is only one other vet in the area, and he's over 50 miles away. I'm sure you're going to be a very big asset to the folks in this area. Caitlin did glance up at my compliment, and I thought I saw her eyes soften a bit. Yes, that would be Doc Harrison, Colleen said. He has more business than he can handle, and is often needed in more than one place at the same time. I agree with you, Carson. Our Caitlin will be able to provide a great service. During the rest of the meal, Caitlin talked with her parents and Sam, who had been on the ranch since before she was born. She didn't address me directly, and I, for the most part, kept quiet. This was her homecoming, and I knew her parents and Sam wanted to hear what had been happening in her life while she was away. As soon as I finished eating, I excused myself to turn in. I returned to my cabin and checked my email, seeing that I had one from Jake. He reported that he had talked to a friend of his on the police force and casually asked if they still considered me to be a missing person. His friend said that everything had been dropped after they received the email with the picture I had sent them. As for Janice, Brandon had apparently dumped her as soon as he learned I had disappeared with all the money, and it didn't look like Janice was going to get her hands on any of it soon. Of course, she couldn't afford the rent on the house we had been living in, and was now living in a seedy apartment, working as a waitress. She didn't have the money to hire a lawyer to pursue me. I thought it ironic. She had apparently only married me for my money, and her boyfriend had only wanted her for the same thing, my money. I was still working on replacing fence posts. I now only did so about every third or fourth day. I had moved out of the hill country and was down where I could drive the pickup to where I worked. It really was easier to load the posts in the back of the truck rather than on the mules. The morning after Kaitlin returned home, I loaded the pickup with posts and drove to where I had left off. When it was my normal time to take lunch, I started to the truck and realized that I hadn't brought my lunch with me. If any of us were going to be working away from the main house all day, Colleen would make sure we had a lunch, and I guess I spaced out picking mine up. I could have driven back to the house, but decided that missing one meal wasn't going to kill me. About a half hour later, I had just set a pole and was attaching the wire when I heard a vehicle approaching. I looked back and saw it was one of the ranch trucks. The truck came to a stop just as I finished with that post. I turned around and was surprised to see Caitlin get out. She had a small sack in her hand like the ones Colleen put our lunches in. Mama said you forgot your lunch, she said, shoving the bag towards me. I reached out and took it from her. Thank you, Caitlin. That was very kind of you, I replied. I looked in the bag and saw it contained two sandwiches as usual. I took one out and offered the other to Caitlin, but she shook her head no. I shrugged my shoulders and went and sat on the tailgate of the truck to eat. Caitlin walked over to where she was standing about five feet to my side and just stared at me. I just sat and ate, keeping my eyes focused in front of me. Why are you here? 
she asked finally. I turned and looked at her and decided to mess with her. You can't tell anybody. I robbed a bank and stashed the money. I'm hiding out here until the heat is off and I can retrieve the cash. At first, her eyes grew wide, then she glared at me. You're a real clown. She huffed and turned to leave. I waited until she was halfway to her truck. Caitlin. She heard me say her name and stopped and slowly turned around. I married a woman who never loved me and only wanted the things I could provide for her. I ended up here because I just wanted to get away from everything I knew for a while. Caitlin again stared at me, and I think she decided I was telling the truth this time. She nodded her head and left without another word. As she drove away, I thought about what her dad had said about her mother being like Caitlin when she was that age. He said he had tamed Colleen, but I suspected that it was their love for each other that was the secret. It had been less than 24 hours since I first met Caitlin, and I couldn't imagine any man taming the fiery redhead. Supper that night was pretty much a repeat of the night before. Caitlin had conversations with her parents and Sam. I didn't really feel slighted. After all, she didn't know me, and we had nothing in common really. We were just finishing dinner when there was a knock on the door, and Bill went to answer it. He came into the kitchen followed by a man about my age. He was what women would call tall, dark, and handsome. Caitlin excitedly called out a name and jumped from her seat and hugged the guy. It was obvious they knew each other. They were gabbing away about how long it had been since they had seen each other. A few minutes later, there was another knock on the door, and Bill went and answered it and returned with another man. This one was fair-haired but also good-looking. He received an equally warm greeting from Caitlin. I recalled Bill's words about having to fend off every male for counties around to win his wife. Caitlin was every bit the prize that her mother was, at least in looks. I excused myself from the table and returned to my cabin. Mentally, I wished the two guys luck. I did envy them, though. If Caitlin turned out to be the woman her mother was, whoever won her affections would be a lucky man. The next day, I took the pickup and rode the range. By the time I had made my rounds, something didn't seem to add up. It was early enough that I went back and got some, and we did a whirlwind tour of the ranch. There were a lot of cattle scattered over the ranch, but he agreed that something didn't feel right. It just seemed like we were short a few head. We decided we would saddle up the next day and ride the hilly areas. We discussed it with Bill that night at supper, and he agreed to our plan. It rained that night, which would make finding tracks more difficult. The next morning, we loaded our horses into a trailer, and Bill drove us to one end of the property. I rode about a third of the way up into the tree line, and Sam rode another third higher. We then headed across the ranch over the hills and through the trees. It took a big part of the day to reach the far side. We counted five stray head. Bill met us as we came out of the hills, and we loaded the horses in the trailer and headed back. We discussed the situation and decided the only thing we could do is be more vigilant. At dinner that night, Caitlin had another suitor call on her. I heard her mother mutter something about that being the third one that day. The word had gotten out that she was back home, and guys were crawling out of the woodwork seeking her attention. The next four days, we spent a lot of time keeping an eye on the herd. Everything seemed to be okay except for the suspected original loss. Caitlin's callers continued to visit. She had been home for a week and hadn't said two words to me since the day she brought me my lunch. The fifth day after the perceived disappearance of the cattle, I told Bill I wanted to ride the property line through the hills. We had already covered all the fence lines along the pasture areas and had seen no evidence that the missing cattle had taken through there. Sam dropped me off on the west side of the ranch. This was where Bill's ranch bordered the Wilson Ranch. About halfway to the southwest corner, I spotted three fresh sets of horse tracks. They crossed from the Wilson side of the fence onto Bill's side. The puzzling thing is that the fence wire was still up. I dismounted and checked the fence posts and saw that the staples had been loosened on five posts and were barely holding the wire up. 
Remove the staples and lower the wire, and you could cross over. Put the wire and staples back, and it looked normal. I remounted and followed the tracks. When I got near the stream, I saw three horses tied to a tree a little ways above the waterfall. I was still about thirty yards away, and I quickly got down, tied my horse to a tree, and pulled the rifle from its scabbard. I crept quietly through the trees, my eyes darting from side to side. When I reached the horses, I could see boot prints leading downstream. I crept to the edge of the waterfall and looked over, and gasped. There was Caitlin in the pool. She was naked as the day she was born. I was mesmerized by the sight. She was swimming through the water, her nude body clearly on display in the clear water. Damn, she had a cute ass. She rolled over onto her back, her firm breasts sticking out of the water. A movement in the trees to her right brought me back to my senses. I quickly scanned the area and saw one guy to the right and two more nearing the pond on the left. I raised my rifle and shot. The bullet hit between the feet of the guy on the right. One more quick pull of the trigger, and the dirt exploded between the two guys on the left. Kaitlin released a blood-curdling scream that echoed through the trees. I stood up so everyone could see me. On your bellies now. I won't miss the next shot, I yelled out. Caitlin, stay where you are. Caitlin didn't see the three men. She only saw me standing over her with a rifle in my hands. Are you crazy, Carson? She screamed. She struggled to cover her naked body. One of the men on the left flinched as if he was going to run. The bark on the tree right next to his face exploded as I pulled the trigger again. He was convinced and dropped flat down. Kaitlin looked to where I had shot and saw the two men. She shrieked again. I said on your stomachs. Three, two. Before I could say one, the other two dropped down. Now put your faces in the dirt and your hands behind your heads. They again did as ordered. Now get out, Caitlin, and get dressed. But Carson, she began to protest. Damn it, Caitlin, just, just do what I tell you. Get dressed and get out of here, I growled at her. Caitlin was clearly scared, and I could see her shaking from where I was. But she did as I ordered and walked out of the pool. Like Venus rising from the sea, she stepped out of the water. Even though she kept her back to me, I couldn't take my eyes off her. The sight of her alabaster skin and the most perfectly rounded butt that I have ever beheld were forever etched into my mind. She only put on her jeans and shirt and swung up onto her horse. One kick and she was gone through the trees. When she was gone, I ordered the men one by one to get up on the dace and lie back down. Only when all three lay before me did I breathe a sigh of relief. I decided it was time for a bluff. So, what am I going to do with you three? I paused for empty effect. I guess I could just shoot you in the legs and watch you bleed to death. The three men began to beg me to save their lives. I smelled a distinct scent. At least one of them had pissed his pants. Even if I spare you, Caitlin's father will ensure justice when I inform him of your heinous intentions toward his daughter. Unless, of course, you have a more compelling confession for the sheriff. Something like Caffel rustling. It may lead to jail time, but at least it guarantees you a chance at life. The smallest among them cracked. Yes, we did it. Wilson said breaking Buckman would secure his land. Another hushed him, shut up. I ain't dying for damn cows, the smaller man retorted. Anticipating Caitlin's swift return and her father's inevitable investigation, I opted to bide my time. True to expectation, 45 minutes later, Bill and Sam galloped into view. I signaled them down, and they raced up to join me atop the rise. What in the hell is happening? Bill demanded, perched on his horse peering down at the three prone figures. It appears some of Wilson's hands paid us an unwelcome visit. I tracked them from the fence line to here. Kaitlin was swimming, and these three were attempting to sneak up on her. I gestured towards the captives. Walking over, I pressed the barrel of my rifle against the smaller man's neck. 
I believe this one has something he wants to confess to you. Prodding him again, he whimpered, We did it. We took some of your cattle. But it was Wilson who forced us. Bill tilted his hat back, grinning at me. You know, when my grandfather ran this ranch, they'd hang horse thieves and cattle rustlers. Sometimes justice seemed simpler back then. Too bad we have to be civilized these days. While Sam stood guard, Bill and I decided to march the rustlers back down. With rifles in hand, we trailed behind them, Sam tethering their horses together and bringing up the rear. Upon reaching the buildings, we led the rustlers into the barn, placing them in separate stalls with open doors that allowed us to keep watch without them seeing each other. Bill went into the house to call the sheriff, while Sam and I stood guard. In under thirty minutes, the sheriff raced up the lengthy mile-long drive. Bill and I met him, briefing him on the unfolding events. I proposed bringing the smaller culprit out first for the sheriff to interrogate, and he agreed. I promptly had my prisoner outside, unmistakably identified by the pungent odor of fear-induced excrement. Initially hesitant, the little rustler seemed to reconsider his silence and began to speak. It appears, Bill, that we've got a straightforward case of trespassing here. Honestly, it's a bit of a waste of my time, but I suppose I could leave them in your hands, forget I saw them, and let you handle things, the sheriff remarked. The frightened rustler's eyes widened, and he suddenly opened up. The sheriff soon extracted the truth, calling for backup. Soon, a convoy of sheriff vehicles streamed onto Wilson's vast ranch. Despite its extensive 16,000-acre expanse, the sheriffs pinpointed the location provided by the rustler, discovering almost 100 stolen cattle bearing the rocking bee brand. By day's end, Wilson and his cohorts were incarcerated. Amidst the commotion, it was well past nine before we gathered for supper. Caton, though seated at the table, kept her gaze fixed on her plate. What were you doing up there? Bill inquired, addressing Caitlin as he hadn't had much chance to speak with her. I was just taking a swim. I didn't think anyone would come spy on me. She cast me an accusing glare. Firstly, Caitlin, I interjected, I wasn't spying on you. I traced their horse tracks to the stream. Secondly, consider what might have happened if I hadn't been there. I doubt those three were planning a picnic when they saw you swimming naked. Caitlin's face flushed crimson. Thank goodness you arrived when you did, Carson, Colleen remarked. I hate to think what might have happened. The conversation shifted, and we hurriedly finished our meal, aware of an early start the next day. Exiting the kitchen toward my cabin, Kaitlin called out to me. I halted and waited as she snapped rudely, so did you enjoy the view today? Expecting gratitude proved too optimistic. Let's just say I'd be dishonest if I claimed it wasn't breathtaking. Kaitlin huffed and turned on her heels, marching off toward the house. I stood, shaking my head, acknowledging there was something about me that consistently irked her. The following day, Bill had to head into town to officially file charges against Wilson. Returning the stolen cattle to their rightful place would take several days, as the prosecutor needed to thoroughly document the case first. Sam and I spent the day refreshing the paint on some of the outbuildings. We had lunch in the kitchen, but Caitlin chose not to join us, a decision that suited me just fine. Bill returned in the early afternoon, but waited until dinner to share the developments. He explained that since this wasn't a capital case, Wilson and his accomplices would be released on bail. While he didn't anticipate any further trouble, he cautioned us to remain vigilant. Bill glanced at his daughter, grinning mischievously. If you're planning on another nude swim anytime soon, maybe you should take Carson along. You know, for protection, he teased Caitlin, chuckling. Caitlin's face turned crimson again and she sputtered as she stood, kicking her chair backward, and raced from the room. Bill and Sam erupted in laughter, and even Colleen couldn't help but giggle. I chuckled along with them. After the laughter subsided, we resumed our meal. Bill continued his good-natured teasing. I really want to thank you, Carson. 
Wilson could have seriously jeopardized this ranch financially. You're worth every penny I pay you. We all shared another round of laughter. Three days later, Bill received the news that he could retrieve his cattle. We loaded three horses into a trailer and drove to Wilson's Flying Doe Ranch, accompanied by a sheriff's escort. Colleen came along to drive the truck and trailer back. Once we unloaded the horses, Bill, Sam, and I started pushing the cows back toward his ranch, feeling like characters in a western movie on a cattle drive. As we approached the Rocking Bee Ranch, I rode ahead and loosened part of the fence line, allowing the cattle to cross over. After ensuring all the cattle were back where they belonged, we secured the fencing and rode back to the main house, satisfied with the day's work. Caitlin, during this time, had applied for her veterinary license. As the approval process typically took around 45 days, she could only tend to the animals on her father's ranch for now. I'd spot her around the property and, of course, at mealtime. Despite her continued silent treatment, if I managed to catch her eye, I'd offer a big grin and wiggle my eyebrows, always enough to make her blush. Two weeks after the waterfall incident, we found ourselves in the barn simultaneously. Been enjoying any swims lately? I quipped, wiggling my eyebrows suggestively. Kaitlin approached, standing inches away, and shot me a glare. Why are you such an asshole? She snapped. I shrugged, grinning. Why are you such a bitch? I retorted. Her right hand aimed for my face, but I reacted swiftly, grabbing her wrist before she could strike. Undeterred, she tried with her left, yet I caught that too. I pushed both hands behind her back, pinning them and forcing her body against mine. Slowly, I lowered my face toward hers, stopping when our lips were just an inch apart. Kaitlin stared at me with wide eyes, but she made no effort to break free. If you were mine, I'd put you over my knee and spank your cute little butt, I whispered. A loud gasp escaped Caitlin. You wouldn't dare, she said, attempting to pull back. Suddenly, I released my hold, and she tumbled backward, landing on her cute little butt. It's not that I wouldn't dare. I just got rid of one woman who doesn't care about me, and I'm not wasting my time on another one. Traditionally, Caitlin was the one to storm off, but this time, it was my turn. I left the barn, leaving her sitting on the ground with her mouth agape. I didn't encounter her again until supper. Predictably, she didn't speak to me, but I couldn't decipher the look she gave me. Not that I ever claimed to understand women anyway. My marriage to Janice proved that. The following day, I was in the barn tending to the stalls when Bill walked in. Knowing it was his day off on Sunday, I figured he wanted to talk. I wondered if Caitlin had informed him of the previous day's incident, and if he had come to ask me to leave. I stopped my work as he approached. I heard you and Caitlin had a little showdown yesterday, he remarked. Well, that answered my question about whether Caitlin had confided in her father. But I noticed a twinkle in Bill's eyes. Yeah, I suppose you could say that. Probably my fault. I admitted. Maybe, maybe not. I think her issue is she doesn't know what to make of you. First, she thought you were here for something. Then you became the hero who saved her and the ranch. What she can't figure out is why you aren't chasing after her like the other local young men. Like her mother at her age, Caitlin is used to having boys wrapped around her little finger. She's had a few boyfriends, but none lasted. I don't think she really respected them. I just hope you don't let her chase you off. In my book, you're welcome here as long as you want. Thanks, Bill. That means a lot to me. As for Caitlin, I'll quit teasing her, and hopefully we can live and let live, I expressed. Bill left the barn, and I resumed my work. I had the rest of the day to ponder Bill's words. If Caitlin wanted to understand me, acting civilly, and having a conversation would be more effective than her current approach. As for pursuing her like the others, that simply wasn't in the cards. Caitlin didn't join us for supper that night, a topic no one broached, and I didn't inquire. The following day, I stuck to my routine, waking up at five as usual, even on my day off. Breakfast done, 
After Sam and Bill left for work, I retrieved my laundry. Bill had invested in a large commercial washer and dryer, making it possible for me to wash all my clothes in a single load. The laundry room was adjacent to the kitchen, so while my clothes washed, I sat at the kitchen table, sipping coffee and chatting with Colleen. Caitlin entered, an uncommon occurrence for breakfast, usually opting to eat later. Colleen asked about my plans for the day. I was thinking of driving into town. Anything you want me to pick up for you? I inquired. If you wouldn't mind, there are a couple of things you could get for me, Colleen replied. I wouldn't mind at all, I assured her. Could I ride into town with you? I heard Caitlin interject. I looked up in surprise. I was planning to go to the general store for a few things, and it seems like a waste of gas for both of us to drive separately, she explained, justifying her request. Sure, I'd be happy to give you a lift, I responded, still taken aback. After yesterday, I hadn't expected her to talk to me, let alone want to ride anywhere together. I'll be leaving in about an hour and a half, after my laundry is done and put away. Okay, I'll be ready, Caitlin said. She finished preparing something to eat and sat at the table, remaining quiet while Colleen and I continued our conversation. As I stepped out of my cabin later, Caitlin emerged from the back door, looking stunning in a turquoise sundress that complemented her red hair. The bare arms and shoulders revealed by the dress's straps showcased unblemished skin, without a trace of freckles. She glided toward me with grace, keeping her crystal blue eyes fixed on me. It was evident she wanted me to notice her. Holding the passenger side door open for her, I watched as she slid into the car. We set off, and for the first half of the trip, she sat quietly, observing the countryside. I thought you were going to kiss me yesterday, she suddenly remarked. I glanced at her, but she seemed to be looking out the side window, and I couldn't see her face. Well, while that may not have been unpleasant, I do have a rule about not forcing unwanted affections upon unreceptive females. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw her head spin around, and I could tell she was staring at me. Caitlin sat quietly, but I noticed her occasional glances in my direction. We pulled into the general store, and we went inside. I needed to grab a couple of new pairs of jeans and shirts, while Caitlin had a list of things her mother wanted. An hour later, we had everything loaded. I had one more stop to make at the hardware store for a couple of things for Bill, but it was lunchtime, and I was hungry. I suggested we stop for a bite to eat, and Caitlin agreed. We pulled into the same diner where I had first met Bill and Colleen. We took a table sitting across from each other, and ordered our food. As we sat in silence, I began to think that perhaps I should have just gone straight to the hardware store, and back to the ranch. Just then, the door swung open, and three men entered. I recognized two of them as the guys who had come calling on Caitlin. They made a beeline for our table, with two taking the seats on either side while the third stood behind me. They ignored me and started talking to Caitlin. I stood up and gestured for the third one to take a seat. I caught Caitlin's glare as I moved to the next table. When the waitress brought our food, I motioned her over and had her place my meal in front of me. I ate quickly, paying no attention to the conversation at Caitlin's table. Tossing some bills on the table to cover our meals, I stood up. Kaitlin had hardly touched her food, and her plate was still full. I'm going to run over to the hardware store. I can stop back by here later and see if you're ready to go, I said, intervening in their conversation. Kaitlin pushed her plate back and stood up. No, I'll go with you. It was nice seeing you guys again, but we have to run, she said. The guys at the table tried to protest with one even offering her a ride home. She declined and followed me out to my SUV. As we drove to the hardware store, she stayed in the vehicle, appearing to fume. The silent tension persisted as we drove back to the ranch, turning off the highway onto the mile-long driveway. Why did you do that? she asked. What? I replied, uncertain about what she was pointing out. Moving to the other table, she stated. Oh, that. 
Well, I thought you'd prefer spending time with your friends. Besides, I didn't want to be in the middle of their competition for your attention. You really are an asshole, she snapped. Wisely, I kept my mouth shut. I had no desire to fend off her slaps while driving. Pulling up to the main house, Kayton immediately grabbed what she could carry as soon as I opened the rear of the SUV. I picked up more bags and followed her retreating figure into the house. As I walked in the back door, she dumped everything on the kitchen table without a word to her mother, then strode out of the room. Colleen looked at me questioningly. I shrugged, saying, I guess I'm an asshole. Colleen giggled and walked over, putting a hand on my arm. I have never seen anyone have the effect on Caitlin that you seem to have, she said in a low voice. I guess I was born to just piss her off, I replied. I'm not so sure about that, she said, leaving me confused. I returned to my cabin and stowed away my new clothes. Deciding not to stay cooped up, I went to the barn and saddled a horse. Riding out, I ended up at the top of the waterfall. With the weather being nice, I tied the horse to a tree and sat at the edge of the falls, looking down at the clear pool. Sitting there for half an hour, maybe longer, Kaitlin rode up below me getting off her horse and not wanting to be accused of spying in case she was going skinny dipping again, I picked up a stone and tossed it down, creating a splash in the water. Caitlin looked around, seeking the source of the noise, and spotted me. Anticipating her departure, she instead mounted her horse and rode up to where I was sitting. She tied her horse next to mine and walked towards me. I stood up, taking a few steps away from the edge in case she planned on pushing me off. You're an asshole, she said, stopping inches from me. And you're still a bitch, I said. This time, I didn't wait for the slap. I grabbed her around the waist and kissed her. Quickly releasing her, I tried to move towards my horse. Her hand seized my arm and turned me back around. I was flabbergasted when she reached behind my neck and pulled me into another kiss. Our tongues sought each other and were quickly entangled. Both of us were panting when our lips parted. Kaitlin looked at me with glassy eyes. We found ourselves in a passionate kiss again. As the passion grew, our clothes disappeared. Kaitlin pulled me sharply toward her and I lay on top of her. Our rapprochement was not slow and gentle, but like two animals. After a few minutes, she cried out in pleasure. I supported her by roaring and filling her. Not wanting to overpower her, I rolled to the side and gently drew her into my arms. As we gasped for breath, our bodies glistened with a sheen of sweat. Gradually, our breathing normalized, and we lingered in each other's embrace. Let's go for a swim, Caitlin whispered. I nodded, and we collected our clothes. Still unclothed, we guided our horses to the pool. I admired her as she led the way into the cool water. We waded in up to our chests, and Caitlin moved into my arms. Her legs effortlessly wrapped around my waist, and our lips met in another passionate kiss. My desire surged, and I pressed against her. She shifted until I found what I sought, and once again we merged. This time, our movements were unhurried, the water unable to wash away her natural sickness. Our lips stay locked as I entered her, and once more we climaxed together. I held her close as she trembled in my arms, the water's buoyancy preventing my legs from giving way. Caitlin rested her head against my shoulder, and I embraced her until the water's chill forced us out. In silence, we dressed, mounted our horses, and rode back down. After stabling our mounts, Caitlin came to me wrapping her arms around my neck for another kiss. Without a word, she turned and walked to the main house. In a daze, I returned to my cabin, slipping into the shower. The hot water cascaded over me as I pondered the events. One thing became clear. I harbored much stronger feelings for this captivating woman than I had acknowledged to myself before. I barely had time to dress for supper. Upon entering the kitchen, Bill Colleen, and Sam were already present, but Caitlin was nowhere in sight. As we took our seats, she walked in, choosing the chair beside mine instead of her usual place next to Sam. 
Bill and Colleen exchanged glances, while Caitlin merely smiled sweetly in response. During dinner, Caitlin chatted animatedly. Despite her parents' curiosity, they refrained from asking why their daughter was in such high spirits. After supper, Caitlin assisted her mother in cleaning the kitchen, while Sam and I headed back to our cabins. Just as I had settled between the sheets, a soft knock echoed on my door. Clad in only my boxes, I opened the door, and Caitlin slipped inside, finding her way into my arms. We shared a tender kiss, and she guided me back to my bed, joining me after shedding her clothes. Once again, we made love before drifting off to sleep in each other's embrace. The abrupt arrival of 5 a.m. prompted me to groggily reach over and silence the blaring alarm. Caitlin, still nestled against me, emitted a small moan at the intrusion of the sound. With great reluctance, I managed to extract myself from bed. I illuminated the bathroom and dressed for the day, leaving a gentle kiss on Caitlin's head before slipping out of the cabin. During breakfast, I couldn't ignore the scrutinizing glances from Bill and Colleen. I wondered if they were aware of their daughter's nocturnal whereabouts. Following the meal, I loaded the pickup for another day of setting fence posts. Working alone on a ranch afforded ample time for contemplation. My thoughts drifted to my recent past, astounded that only three months had elapsed since leaving my wife. It felt like a lifetime. I ruminated on the significance of Bill, Colleen, and Sam in my life, and then my musings shifted to the beautiful Caitlin and the shared moments from the previous day. I pondered the possibility of finding the kind of love her parents embodied. At lunch I realized, once again, that I had forgotten to bring my meal. As the thought crossed my mind, I heard a pickup approaching in haste. Kaitlin jumped out, running toward me with a bag in hand. She threw herself at me, initiating a passionate kiss. Mama said you forgot your lunch, she giggled. Disregarding the meal, I pulled her in for another heated kiss. Although I didn't set as many fence posts that day, I did set my post in her a couple of times. Amid our moments of passion, we also found time to talk. I divulged the details of my former life, recounting how my ex-wife had betrayed me. Caitlin admitted her fear that I might leave. Caitlin, all I can say is that the only way I will leave is if you tell me to go, I reassured her. Caitlin eventually returned home, and I finished my day's work. After showering and changing, she was in the kitchen when I entered, once again choosing the seat next to mine. Midway through our meal, a knock sounded at the front door. Bill answered it and returned with the same guy, who had been the first to call on Caitlin. Remaining seated, Caitlin looked at him, her expression unreadable. I was wondering if you'd like to go for a drive, he suggested. In this part of the country where options were limited, going for a drive was essentially a euphemism for going on a date. I appreciate the offer, Caitlin responded. But I don't think my boyfriend would like it. She leaned over and planted a kiss on my cheek. Mr. Tall, dark, and handsome blushed and stammered before making a hasty exit. With that exchange, our relationship was now out in the open. I glanced at Bill and Colleen, noticing smiles of approval. Even Sam sported a big grin. We had officially become a couple. In the following days, there were no more visits from local men calling on Caitlin. She made it clear that she was not available. I found a way to assist Caitlin with her plans. She was seeking a loan from the bank to purchase the necessary equipment for her veterinary business. The bank was hesitant to offer an unsecured loan, and the only option was to have her father put the ranch up as collateral. She was reluctant to ask him. I suggested giving me a couple of days. I might have a solution. I contacted my offshore bank, setting up an account under the guise of a fictitious loan company. Kaitlin filled out a loan application on my computer, which I had set up to route to my email. After waiting a couple of days, I sent her notice that her loan had been approved and a wire transfer would be made to her account. Caitlin was thrilled by the news but questioned why the loan only carried a 2% annual percentage rate. I explained that they were a non-profit philanthropic group, providing loans to those they believed would contribute to the community. 
While I could have simply offered her the money, I knew she was too proud to accept it. Having earned her degree through hard work, she was determined to succeed on her own terms. By the time her license was approved, she had purchased a new van transformed into a mobile vet office, complete with necessary medical instruments. Once word spread about her license status, calls for her services came in from local ranchers. Many nights, Caitlin spent with me in my cabin. While Bill and Colleen were aware, they seemed to have no objections. At 27, Caitlin was old enough to make her own decisions. It took three months for Wilson and his crew to face trial. The case was relatively straightforward. The smallest guy cooperated with the prosecution, receiving two years probation without prison time. The five other hands working for Wilson each got five years in prison. As the masterman behind the rustling, Wilson received the maximum sentence of 10 years and a $50,000 fine. When Wilson was taken to prison, I initiated an investigation into him and his ranch. Discovering that he was single with no family in the area, and with all his hands incarcerated, there was no one left to run the ranch. This led me to formulate a new plan. However, before setting it in motion, I needed to address some unfinished business. I had to finalize my divorce. The thought of Janice getting half my money was not something I could accept. To achieve this, I turned to my friend Jake, seeking his assistance once again. Instead of sending an email, I called him and asked him to talk to Janice. I wanted him to convey that I had reached out and wished to propose a settlement in exchange for a divorce. The offer was a straightforward $50,000. If she declined, she would never hear from me again, and she would not receive any money. Initially playing innocent, she demanded to know why I had left and why I wouldn't return. The charade ended when Jake revealed that I knew about her affair with Brandon and her intention to divorce me. With her game exposed, Janice, still working as a waitress and struggling financially, accepted my offer. To proceed, I needed to return to Texas and engage a lawyer to draw up the divorce papers. Caitlin wasn't thrilled when I informed her of my departure. I explained that I needed to close that chapter of my life and assured her that I would return. Initially planning to leave my vehicle in long-term parking at the airport, Caitlin insisted on taking me and being there upon my return. Leaving behind my SUV and most of my belongings, except for what fit in one suitcase, seemed to ease her concerns. I departed on a Sunday, and upon my arrival, Jake picked me up at the airport. Staying with him and his family, I made sure to call Caitlin every night. By Friday, all the paperwork was sorted out. Jake took Janice to my lawyer, explaining that she would receive a check for $10,000 immediately, with the remaining $40,000 paid in 60 days after the divorce was finalized. She signed the papers, and my lawyer handed her a $10,000 check. I never had to face Janice. Then came the realization that I had personal items in storage, keepsakes and heirlooms from my parents, yearbooks, and other sentimental belongings. Not wanting to return for them later, I rented a moving van and loaded it up. Kaiten was initially taken aback when I revealed I wasn't flying back. But once I explained that I was bringing back everything important to me, her excitement about my return grew. It took me three days of relentless driving to cover the 1,600 miles. As I pulled into the Rocking Bee Ranch on Tuesday evening, I was greeted with an enthusiastic welcome from everyone. That night, Caitlin continued to extend her warm welcome until the early morning, when we finally fell asleep, thoroughly exhausted. With the first part of my plan accomplished, I was now ready to put the rest into action. This involved making several trips to the prison where Wilson was incarcerated. My goal was to persuade him to sell me his ranch. Initially resistant, I continued to present my case. I pointed out that he would be imprisoned for at least seven years, and even with good behavior, he wouldn't be eligible for parole. With no one to tend to his ranch, his house and buildings would likely deteriorate and his cattle might perish without proper care in the winter. I also raised the question of whether he would be welcomed back into ranching country after his conviction. Faced with the prospect of ruin, 
he eventually accepted my offer, providing him with something to start over with upon release. The next step was securing financing. I moved my money back into the country, confident that Janice wouldn't jeopardize her $40,000 by taking any rash actions. I negotiated a price of $5 million with Wilson, which was below the property's true value, making it relatively easy to find financing. I made a down payment of half a million and financed the remaining amount, taking a month to finalize everything. I kept my activities a secret from everyone except Caitlin and Bill. I explained to them that I had personal business related to my assets that needed attention. Although it consumed only one or two days of my time per week, I set up a corporation and registered the land under its name. With summer ending and fall setting in, I hired someone to harvest the hay on the property. Additionally, I employed four hands to live on site and manage the ranch in the interim. The most experienced hand was appointed temporary foreman. I clarified that for a while, I would be an absentee owner despite my close proximity. I assured him he could always reach me by phone, and I planned to visit the ranch frequently. The final element of my plan involved remodeling the main house, a two-story, five-bedroom structure in need of modernization. Despite Caitlin's frustration with my secrecy about my activities, our relationship continued to thrive. My love for her grew each day, and I sensed that she felt the same way about me. Meanwhile, her veterinary business flourished requiring her to be on the road frequently, but she remained content and happy. It reached a point where I nearly spilled the beans to Caitlin about what I was doing. After returning from checking on the remodeling, she cornered me with questions. What the hell is going on, Carson? Are you seeing someone else? She demanded. God, no. I swear there is no one else. I just have some things I need to take care of. Please believe me. I promise I'll tell you everything soon. I love you, Caitlin. I'm asking for you to trust me. Trust in our love. Caitlin scrutinized my face, searching for the truth, and her eyes softened. Okay, Carson. I do trust you. But you better tell me what's going on soon, or I'm going to kick your ass, she warned. I grabbed her and kissed her with all the love I had. As spring arrived and calving season began, the main house renovation was complete. It was time to execute the final part of my plan. One afternoon, when I had Caitlin alone, I asked her to go for a drive. Honey, I've been thinking that it's time for me to leave the Rocking Bee Ranch, I said to her with a serious expression. Instantly, her eyes welled up with tears. But Carson, you promised you wouldn't leave, she said, her chin quivering. I had timed it so that we were at the entrance to the former Flying Do Ranch, now without a sign over the gates. I turned in and started driving down the private road. Well, I wasn't really planning on going far, I said. Caitlin looked around, clearly confused. I'm not sure she had heard what I said. Carson, what are we doing on Wilson's land? I delayed my answer until we pulled up to the main house. Come on, I want to show you something. I got out of the truck and went around to open her door. Taking her hand, I led her up to the front door and opened it. Carson, she hissed. What the hell are you doing? We could get in trouble for this. Relax, honey. Wilson doesn't own this ranch anymore. Let's look around. I want to know what you think about the house. Caitlin stared at me, shaking her head, but allowed me to guide her around the house. I took her upstairs, and we walked through the bedrooms and then back downstairs. There was a large living room, a nicely panelled den, two rooms set up as home offices, and finally, the kitchen. I could tell by her face that she loved the new kitchen. There was only one room with furnishings, and that was the one I intended to use for my office. The rest of the house awaited her decisions on how she wanted to furnish it. What do you think of the house? I asked her. It's really nice, she replied. Do you think you could live here? Damn it, Carson. What the hell is going on? I could see she was confused and getting upset. I dropped to one knee and put my hand into my jacket pocket. Caitlin, Wilson no longer owns this ranch. I do. 
I am asking if you could live here. Could you live here as my wife? You own this? She asked with wide eyes. I nodded. Yes. I then took the engagement ring out of my pocket and held it up. Caitlin, I love you with all my heart. Will you be my wife? Caitlin's face scrunched up and her eyes filled with tears. At first, I thought I had made a mistake until she tackled me onto my back and covered my face in kisses. Yes, Carson. Yes, I will marry you, she shrieked. Our next kiss was filled with passion. Caitlin then presented me her finger so I could put the ring on her. She looked around the house with new eyes, running from room to room and examining everything. I patiently waited until she came running back into my arms. The house is beautiful. I love it, she said enthusiastically. I led her across the room to two doors that opened off a hallway. There are two offices, one for you to run your business from and one for me, I said, earning me another long kiss. I led her into the office with the desk and pulled out a large piece of paper. It had a drawing of a property gate, and over it, it said Double C Ranch. Kaitlin looked it over, and her brows furrowed. What is the Double C? she asked. That stands for the Carson and Caitlin Ranch. I saw the light bulb go on. Oh my God, that's perfect, she cried. She started pulling at my clothes, and I joined in stripping her off. When we were naked, I set her on top of the desk and christened the office with our love. In the days to come, we made love in every room of our home. Once we had recovered and dressed, I told Caitlin it was time to go tell their parents. She was so happy that I think she floated out to the truck. We got back a few minutes after six and Bill, Colleen and Sam were already in the kitchen for supper. We walked in together and Caitlin held up her left hand. We're getting married, she squealed. Colleen jumped up and ran over to hug her daughter, while Bill and Sam came and pumped my hand and pounded me on the back. I then got a big hug from my future mother-in-law, while Caitlin hugged her father and Sam. When things calmed, we all sat down to eat. Caitlin waited until everyone was eating. Of course, this means we will be moving, she said as nonchalantly as possible. What? exclaimed Bill, Colleen, and Sam in unison. Tell them, sweetheart, Caitlin said to me. I nodded. Well, Bill, you know how Wilson wanted to combine his ranch with yours? I was thinking it could be a good thing, I said. Bill stood up, looking furious. There is no way in hell the flying doll is going to get my ranch, he roared. I laughed. Bill calmed down. It is no longer the flying doll, it's the double C ranch, and the new owners are sitting at your table right now. What the hell are you talking about? He shouted, now totally confused. I bought out Wilson, and now the ranch belongs to Caitlin and me, I explained. Double C Carson and Caitlin, Colleen said. She got it right away. Bill, I thought if we combined the two ranches, you could run them. We would split the profit 50-50, I added. But the flying, I mean double C, is over twice the size of my ranch. It brings in a lot more profit, he said. Bill, you have done this all your life. I need your help. I would like us to be equal partners. You would be in charge of the operations. What you say goes. Besides, it is part Caitlin's ranch too. It will be keeping everything in the family, I explained. Bill sat down and looked at Colleen. She nodded her head. Bill stuck his hand across the table to me, and we shook on it. Damn it, Carson, this is going to take some getting used to, but I accept your offer. This means we're going to have more hands to oversee, and that means Sam will be a head foreman, I said. Then I groaned. And now I get to pull out all those fence posts I worked so hard to set on that side of the property. Everyone laughed at me. Supper that night was a loud and boisterous celebration. Kaitlin spent the night in my cabin and wore me out. We were late for breakfast the next morning, but everyone was still in the kitchen when we came in. They were waiting for us to eat so we could all drive over to the Double C, and Caitlin could show off her new house. Everyone was impressed, and I saw Colleen stare jealously at the refurbished kitchen. 
It took Caitlin and her mother a month to furnish the house. It was ready to move into on our wedding night. We were married on the double C bill and his family were respected and well-liked, and ranchers and their families for miles around came to celebrate the day. As Caitlin's husband, Bill's son-in-law, and the new owner of the Double C Ranch, I was welcomed into their society. Late that night, we finally got to bed, and we stayed there, making love that night and most of the next day. We would still be there, but on our third day of marriage, I took my bride to Fiji for a tropical honeymoon. Our first roundup that year paid off well, and we sent a lot of cattle to market, making a nice profit. A significant portion went to pay off the loan, but with Caitlin's business, we were making a comfortable living. We even built a nice new house for Sam, and he now has a girlfriend close to his age who lives in town. We may be having another wedding soon. Another year has gone by, and my beautiful wife has just given me the most fantastic news. She's pregnant. We're going to have a baby. We're driving over right now to tell the future grandparents. One final word before I go. I know there are those who will say I should have learned my lesson the first time and had Caitlin sign a prenuptial agreement. If so, then you really haven't gotten to know my Caitlin. She isn't Janice. She works hard at her job and takes care of our home. She is her mother's daughter and she shares her love with me every day. With me and only me. Every day that I look into her blue Irish eyes, I see that love.